adopt these principles not for the sake of copying, but for the sake of appreciate. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 392, with my guest, Grandmaster Quinn No. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. And martial arts is, is kind of my jam. I love it. And that's why we have Whistlekick. And you can check out everything that we work on at whistlekick.com while you're there. Use the code PODCAST15. That'll get you 15% off any of our shirts, t shirts, sweatshirts, sweatpants, uniforms, hats, sneakers, sparring gear. What else we got? Uh, it's a lot. There's a lot going on over there. So just check it out. And don't forget, it's more than just products. We have a lot of other things that we work on here at Whistlekick. And whistlekick.com is kind of the hub that'll tie into everything that we're working on. Of course, this show has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, because we like to keep the names easy. And that's where you can find everything relating to this and the other 391 episodes. We bring you two a week, all for free. And hopefully, you'll share them around and comment and to show us some love. Because after all, the martial arts is better when we're all participating. We've had quite a few people on the show over the years who have started their own style or inherited a family style. And today's guest is one of those folks. Grandmaster No inherited the style that his father founded in the 60s that bears some almost eerie similarities in philosophy to uh, another style that you've heard of. And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about a lot more. The stories that this man has are amazing, compelling, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy this one. So sit back, check it out. Grandmaster No, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, or afternoon here in Florida. Yeah, it, it's so afternoon for, for both of us. Yeah. But it's, it's well, you're in Florida, so it's probably sunny there. It's a good, a, a good bet that it's sunny, but miraculously, it's actually sunny here in Vermont at the moment, which usually only happens in the mornings. Yes, Vermont's a very nice state. I went there in college and uh, snow ski for the first time when I was 19. And didn't have the right equipment, obviously, and wear jeans and <laughs> sweatshirt. And you know how that goes when you wear jeans and sweatshirt, it gets wet. I do. I do. It, it's, it's not a fun day when you start out that way. Very nice day and very good to visit. And two years ago, my wife and I went visit Vermont. And we went up there in August trying to escape the... Florida heat for three weeks. Well, lo and behold, when we got there, it was the heat wave came through there. Sure was. So it's actually hot. <laughs> we there. There have been plenty of times in August where, you know, that Vermont, the Northeast, is hotter than the South. You know why? Because you guys don't have air conditioning in the house. <laughs> so the Airbnb we rent and has no air conditioning. At least oh. in Florida, you. You can turn it on. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I have one, but it usually stays in the garage. About, about half the time I have to take it out for, for about one week a year. There's a, there's a joke that a friend of mine told me when I first moved to Vermont. And he said, when, when people ask me about my summer plans, they say, you know, what do you do in Vermont in the summer? And I say, well, we usually take that week off from work. Oh, and do what? Well, because it's such a short summer. Take that week off, uh, the week of summer in Vermont, because it, it usually I got you. it's usually pretty pretty short. But of course, we're not here to talk about weather. We're not here to talk about the differences between Vermont and Florida, although that's a pretty long list. We're here to talk about martial arts, and we're here to talk yeah, about it's... specifically you and and your story. So let's let's start in probably the most fundamental way that we could. How did you find the martial arts? Uh, my father started a martial arts called Kung Yu, mean hard and soft, in Vietnam in 1965. And ironically, I was born in 65, so I always called Kung Yu as my twin. And he came to the United States in 1971 to get his PhD in entomology at University of Florida, and he started the first dojo there. And when he left, that dojo 
grew two, three, four different dojos. And when we came back and developed, and now we have over 50 schools uh, all over the country, and one in, two in Venezuela, two in Germany, one in France, and about a handful in Vietnam, but it's about 50 in the United States. Uh, and so I kind of grew up going to the dojo in the beginning to play around and kind of look around and you get into the atmosphere that you see other adult kids trying. And so you decided you don't want to fall behind. So you work. And my dad made it fun for us to do karate. So it's not really a chore to go. It's more of a things to do for fun. And then eventually it grow on you. It becomes a routine and then it becomes your habit. And then that's what you do. And, uh, I'll probably say growing up in martial art world, the part that enticed me the most is probably the people. It's the punch, the kick, the stances, the throwing, the armbar, the weapon, all that. It's repetitive, somewhat different levels that you learn. And once you achieve it, you feel like you get this cutters down or this spinning kicks down or you need to work more on your roles. But it's the classmates and the people that you train with, they're, they're interchangeable. So you learn different personnel and, and you, the enjoyment of training with people is what kept me going all these years. And it holds true till today. I always enjoy um, so, oh, Please continue. Yeah, yeah. And you know, so that just a quick backdrop. So my dad left, came back to Vietnam in 1974. And the country fell under the communist regime in 75. So we got stay behind. And it took us two years to plan and escape. And the, our motto was freedom or death. We decided we have to leave. And we escaped out of the little fishing boat and float out in the uh, South Pacific Ocean in the month of rough May, May for about five days and four, five nights and four days. And we got picked up by a merchant ship from Indonesia. It was coming back from Japan and come through that coast and pick us up. And uh, we went to the refugee camp and stayed there for about six months and then got sponsored and came back to America. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the, the club, ironic. That. Keep going, yeah, keep going. So the ironic, yeah, the ironic is the club that my dad started, martial arts, when he came to Florida. Now my three children is actually teaching martial, same style, Kung Yu, at that club still. In college there. Uh, but the escape from Vietnam was 20 of us, uh, three different families, 20 of us in a little fishing boat. And we float out in the ocean just just for enough for about 10 days worth of food and drink. And if nobody picked us up, then just what happened to many millions of people didn't happen to us. So um, I wrote a little short bio that, you know, in baseball, they say you have three strikes and you're out. You know, I've actually had three strikes and I'm still here. So. I, I owed a lot to my calling that that's why I live it. I'm a perpetual optimist and positive person because uh, in 1968, there's a big war in, South, in central Vietnam that it's called Hue, uh, the Hue, the Tet Offensive. Uh, the communists bombing and took over the city for two weeks. And we had to hide under a tunnel of a house. and my mom actually delivered my dog, my sister, my baby sister, in that span of two weeks with the communists taking over with three little boys. You know, my oldest brother was only three and I was two and my brother's one. Well, my sister's been born. And um, so that first, and miraculously, none of the bombs hit us or we didn't get discovered or captured. So I should have been dead there. And in 1972, I contract malaria, went to a hospital for nine days and for malnourishment child in a third world country, 
somehow I made it and bad rain for a few weeks after and came through with no modern medicine. And then, of course, the 77 escaped from the boat. I've, you know, I've already looked at it. I've been blessed three times. So uh, I, I love America. This is my country. I'm very loyal and very humble to be here. I own businesses here. My children born and raised here. I'm American at heart because it gave me hope, a uh, future, and outlooks that I've been to the other side. So uh, I'm I'm just a very thankful man. Wow. All right. That, there's a lot there that we're going to go back and talk about. And and the first thing I want to talk about is, of course, the style part. You mentioned that your father had started a style in the 60s. And I know because of this show, I know, I know a little bit about some of the, the, the martial arts from, from each country. And I've done a little bit of research on the martial arts in Vietnam. But you're referring to... You know, uh, the the name is Kun Kun Yu. Yes, Kun Yu means Kun hard Yu? and soft. Yes, okay. Sir. Kun Yu, but you've also referred to the school as a dojo, and you mentioned karate. So, if for the for the folks, in, including me, who have never trained in Kun Yu, what what were the foundational elements? Where where did your father pull the pieces from that became that style? Okay. Uh, my dad, initially, the Kung Yu, he, he trained in a lot in Shotokan in the beginning. So you, you see Kung Yu, the, the first part of white belt through green, you're doing a lot of hard style, block, punch, kick, dance. It's more of a Shotokan base, which is actually very beneficial because when you first train, you kind of want to train for strength, speed, size, just to get understand your body and, and get some fundamental technique now. So the hard style approach was very beneficial. And my dad also trained with, with Bobby Nam and, uh, and judo. And his brother was an Aikido instructor. So the basic of Kung Yu is a blend of pieces of Bobby Nam in a, in more of a soft style. Bobby Nam is more of a soft style. It's a probably a blend of some form of hard versus Wing Chun, you know, movement because it's formed in the Southeast Asia, so it's more for people with a smaller stature. So that's more of a cross between hard and soft in some capacity. And then the Aikido, the foot movement that my dad loves and he uh, he adopt that the principle and then the judo part is when you close combat it's all about leverage angle and and getting your opponents off balance and when you all tied up so he insert piece of the principle of these styles and made it part of the curriculum to go develop from hard to soft and the blend in between with Kata, techniques, cell defense, and, and weapons as well. And he always tried in his, well, it's kind of like building a race car. You, you don't necessarily have the best of everything, but you take the most efficient air conditioning from a Ford, the chassis from a Chevrolet, the, the horsepower of a BMW, a braking system of a Dodge, or, or a rear wheel drive that of a Corvette, you know, you basically your cars is a it's like a potluck. You you take the advantage of, of what's available. And then is and my dad, as we got older, we realized that today they would have diagnosed a man like him with what we call ADHD, you know what that is. <laughs> yes. So he get bored quick. So as he assembled things, he doesn't want to do the exact same thing over and over. So he blends them. And we actually have a full curriculum that almost academic like. So our dojo in San Diego, in Oakland, in Seattle, Washington, Miami, Orlando, we all do it identical for every rank of every technique. It would be like you walk into a Subway franchise and you order 
a BLT, the, the patient look exactly identical. Mm. So we, we have it documented in video and manual all these years. So everybody doing the same thing. So that way there's no discrepancies of interpretation of the final product, so to speak. Now, we've had quite a few people on the show who have trained in, let, let's call them newer styles, styles that, that you know, not your standard fair goju or your standard fair kyokushin or, or, you know, ITF taekwondo, some folks who have trained in something that was founded more recently than that. And some of those people, it's even a family tradition. But I don't know that we've talked to anyone who checks both of those boxes that have 50 different schools using the same curriculum. So what, what is it about Kung Yu and the way that your father presented it and that you've presented and I assume expanded the reach with the different schools that it's grown so much? Uh, it's possible because... Our philosophy on training is about, it's not about the competition to others or other styles, because one of our code of ethics is students should respect all other branches of martial arts and only use karate to protect truth and reason. So we focus more of internal improvement. Uh, and I can describe it to you as kind of like three stages of ego. You have a external rock ego with a rock rolling down the mountains and it knows to crush other rocks. And as it crush other rocks, it collects residue and it gets bigger and bigger. But that big rock eventually will crush itself if it hits another bigger rock or it fall down to the end and it fall into the river and it just lay to the bottom. So the external ego by compares yourself to others may work in the short term, but in the lifetime, it, you, you're going to stop somewhere. With the internal ego, the liquid stage of ego, you learn to navigate around things over, under, or through, uh, or to the side. As long as you flow and progress and move forward, that internal growth will last longer. But our Kung Nu philosophy really is the gaseous state ego where you can actually encapsulate liquid in a glass of water, but it still can evaporate and move within. So, you're, you're, so you, if you have to be content with your own growth and your own movement to develop and stay with the style, because you may learn eight things but you may really be good at only four things, but at least you have eight options to find out who you are. But a certain style, because it's so rigid a certain way, that is really body specific made that way. So you can practice a certain style and do okay at it, but to be really good at it, uh, you know, it's hard. It, it's tough. It'll be like if you're six foot tall, and weighed 150 pounds, you're not going to be excellent at judo against a five foot eight, 150 pound person because they have more leverage. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Kung Yu have a diversity of things that once people learn all the fundamental basics and cards and weapons, they actually, as they get high in rank, they specialize a little bit more in a certain thing that fit their lifestyle, age, body specific, or just the way they see things. So we, we adopt these principles, not for the sake of copying, but for the sake of appreciate the originality where martial arts were created. So I'll, I'll throw in Kung News, Maybe it, it may say hip throw in judo called ogoshi, but the, actually how we execute our throw is a little bit different because we're more hard style, soft style thrown versus a true practitioner in judoka. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and 
So, so people like that. They like it where they can adjust the movement and the technique to their body. So it's more of an art thing versus a science. I think some of the traditional lists in certain art, they, they have so much respect and love for the founders. They, they remember what it's like to learn from the founders. So they keep the exact formula. Basically, it's almost like you, you, you do KFC chicken. You, you're not going to alter that ingredient and that formula in KFC because that's what you know and you want to keep the originality. Well, in Kung Yu, my dad teach you the principle, and we continue doing it, but each individual can alter to make it work according to their body type and the physicality of the technique as long as the base principle is, is understood. Mm-hmm. And so today's generation, you know, you can text with one finger or two fingers or three fingers as long as it works. People more likely not to want to be in someone control their thought process. So it worked for us, and I think because in the Western world, people like to have a little bit of flexibility and adaptability to their own thinking instead of have to rack their brain trying to remember all the exact details of every move. And in a way, it's just a generation thing. Sure. You know, sure. And, yeah. and I grew up very traditional and I learned Aikido and Judo and I love and appreciate the traditional aspect of it. And but trying to remember every little details like a formula in mathematics or chemical reaction in chemistry class, that's become a burden for today's generation. Mm. So my dad is really an adaptable person. He's, uh, he thinks further ahead, and he doesn't get his ego rubbed if someone can reposition the weapons a little bit better, angle to make this move better from what he's shown. He would love that. He actually likes it when you come up and tell him, hey, oh, Sensei Dong, you know, I discovered that if you move over this angle a little bit better and your tempo move over here, it's more efficient. And as soon as you say that, he would tell you that's great and then wanted you to show the other black belt. Mm. So that's my father. Well, I can't say that with other founders. I wouldn't say that. No, I just know my dad. Yeah, my dad is just a, my dad loves it when you have an open mind and when you, you're very open for things. So The way you were describing some of the, the philosophy it's not uncommon for people to look at the martial arts in that way now to shed some of the the constraints that can come with the traditional art. But, you know, if we go back a few decades, as your father was forming this, that was kind of a, a uncommon philosophy. In fact, the only there's only one other person I know of from that era who was talking about things in that way. And of course, that's Bruce Lee. Was your father at all a fan? Are you at all a fan of Bruce Lee and, and the Jeet Kune Do philosophy? Yes. You know, it's, we're, we're not really up and up with it until later, but that's kind of strange in parallel. My dad thinks that way, too. My dad doesn't believe in how you technically can restrain yourself to exactness. If we all build this different, we all different culture, different body movement, different flexibility, and different body specifics. So uh, he doesn't he doesn't get it, and I think through time for years, martial art get into this competition that they put everyone according to their size and weight. So you compete against each other according to weight class and size, so to speak, right? And I think part of that is it dampen dampen the ability to grow because if two persons similar in size throw on each other. You lose the creativity of how you can throw somebody 20 pounds more or four inches taller. You, you, that adaptation doesn't exist because everything you learn, it works because you throw yourself. So my dad 
by coming to the Western world, to America, he changed a certain method of teaching adaptation because if he was staying in Vietnam, you know, we all similar sizes within 10% of each other. But you come to America, the, the sizes and the factors is so diverse that if you can't adopt the Western world, it wouldn't be as popular. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the, the goal of taking someone down has to be taught where my daughter can take me down instead of me taking her down. Because I'm 40 pounds more than she is. You know, and if I teach the same technique that works for me, it wouldn't be efficient for her, and she will eventually get to a certain level, let's say brown belt. She will say, you know what? I'm having a hard time doing this. Let me try to go do something else. So by adopting through time to make it work for everybody, even though you follow the same principles, uh, I think people like that. Mm. And since my dad is is really an open-minded, zero-ego type, now that I look back, Bruce Lee thinks of the same way. He doesn't believe in a certain technique work for everybody. Everybody has to adjust, but but the principle of Jeet Kune Do or center line of trapping, so all works the same. Hmm. It's, in, it's interesting, and it would be, you know, we, we'd have to go to a parallel universe and put put the two of them, your father and Bruce Lee, in a room and and. I'm sure it would have been fascinating to hear that conversation. I bet they would have agreed on quite a bit from what you're saying. Would have been neat. When you talked about your your trials, your three strikes, as you called them, I mean, any one of those experiences would have a significant effect, a profound effect on someone. But for you to go through all three of them, I'm sure had an even bigger effect and i'm wondering when you when you look at those experiences now how did they shape you and how did they shape the way you look at martial arts uh you know i i look at martial art as a tool to make someone feel better or be better for themselves and that's why the word called martial art you can't do one without the other. Uh, it it really make me feel like I'm more efficient in time. I don't waste time because your time may be up at any time. And it makes me more efficient as an instructor. It makes me more efficient to motivate the students and tell them, you know, whatever you do in life, whether it's a job, it's academic, it's a relationship or a hobby. Don't waste time because that's one thing you can't buy back, it's time. And it, it, your health and time, it's in parallel. And if you have both, your perspective in life has to be great. So a lot of people, they look at the material items to define the existence. In reality, they should be content with health and, and time in their hand. But what you do with your time is important. And uh, one of our philosophy, we always say uh, vision without action is a dream soon forgotten. The word here is not vision, the word is action. And so our Eastern philosophy is more work the process the journey was more than destination because there are no shortcuts because there is no end. The, as long as you're alive, your, your goals evolve and, and move in targets. So you want to progress. Progression is actually is perfection in our eyes. So in martial art, it's not the goal to get to green belt or brown belt or black belt or, or kick at a face level, your goal is to be better now than you were a month ago. And that's the goal. And wherever it takes you, you, you're perfect in your own because you're making progress. And again, we tie that back again, Jeremy, to what 
ego, you know, the moment you compare externally, then your ego will get touched. And that's the part we actually talk about all the time, wherever we teach. Mm. And so these items shape me because it makes me realize that I am small in this universe. It's like a grain of sand on the beach. So my existence is up is is not up to me, but whether I excel or extinct is. So I decided if I have three warnings, then I don't want to be exist. I want to excel. So it makes me more humble, make me more focused, more dedicated as a martial artist. But martial art is just still a small facet of life. It's a tool for us to use to make someone see themselves better. You know, because you learn kata one and you achieve it, you learn kata two. You're constantly learning, but somewhere you have this belief that you can achieve things. And people will, our students will leverage the mental and emotional approach in martial art for other things in life. Because ultimately, karate for everyone is still vocational. You know, it's not, it's, it's not something life and death like hundred years ago, you have to protect your crops or your homes and so on. But today is more of a self-help, growth, spiritual, emotional, and then the physical part comes with it because you learn to discover yourself. So yes, it's improved me because I don't take time for granted. I feel like I have a calling in the sense that uh, as long as I'm productive and leave something behind better than me, then when my time's due here, part of me still remains. Mm. And yeah, so I do see the bigger picture. Mm. You mentioned earlier that your children are now teaching your art, your family's art to others. What was it like for them growing up, learning from you? And I assume... I, I don't know um, if your father was involved in teaching them as well, but but that that passing down through the family, you experienced that and you got to contribute that back to them as well. What was that like for you being able to pass on your father's art? Uh, you know, it's almost a duty, but I, I got it pretty easy. I can't take credit here. I've got most of the Black belts, actually, all our black belts in our dojo teach them. I'm just their father. I help tweak them something, give them a little bit here and there. But no, you know, I'm not that Superman who want, who can teach your kids. <laughs> you know, it's hard, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's kind of like you're teaching your spouse a certain thing or she teach you a certain thing, you know, that it gets personal real quick. So I'm lucky that, that they love the art because they know it's important tradition in the family. And But where I'm lucky is the other black belt actually love teaching them and they love learning from all the black belts. And I'm just kind of a supplement, last 5% detail. But I stay involved as a father and just because I am who I am, they know it'll make me happy to to stay on. And I have a little bit different approach. This part right here, I use the Western approach. Because you know, Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy, they all have great, great things. My dad learned to adopt both, including even religions. He would adopt a certain principle of different culture of the earth and religion to make it fit. And in the West, in the Eastern culture, you will make your children do this. In the Western, you give them a flexibility so they think it's their choice. So what I do is I tell them all the time that I appreciate them doing this to make me look good and make me proud. So they feel like they're doing me a favor. And, and as they get older, they realize that they're doing themselves a favor. But initially, when they're young, I want them to feel like, they doing it for me and make me happy and please me versus I'm making them go 
of me. You know, so the mental approach of not making them so it become a burden, make them want to go more. And and just the fact that I'm everyone enjoy teaching and we don't have this domineering uh atmosphere in our dojo where the kid liked it and our student loved it. My dad is a very approachable man and so am I. So we don't have this process to make the student bow down to us like we walk on water or something like that. And it's easy to teach and students love to come because they're not intimidated. And if they feel like they want to stop for a month to take mental break, they don't feel guilty. They would tell us, you know, I'm burnt out. Let me take a month off. Instead of some art, they would make the student feel guilty and make them almost like being a follower. And because of that, you put this spell on the student that you put a lot of mental pressure on them to perform. So it's hard to grow. Uh, it's almost like micromanagement in the business. You know, you teach and you you lead them, you motivate them. It's different than you forcing them. Can we talk about that? The idea of, of students taking a break for a minute, because that's a hot button topic among school owners. <laughs> uh, students, you it's like, you, you know, they go to school. They go to school nine months. They take a little time off. They come back. The, their, their lifestyle here in the Western world they play a sport three, four months. They, they take time off. They play different sports. They take chemistry one semester, next semester, and they may take biology or, or economic American history. So to expect someone to go four or five years in a row without that time break in between, it, uh, it's not healthy. And so the student from time to time, they would take a week or two off. And with today, you want to keep them inspired, and you don't want to keep them inspired in the sense of making them feel like they have to take the test to be to be justified somebody. And I think most martial art who approach is they feel like if you don't get to black belt, you fail. You fail by not getting to the ultimate goal. Uh, and so the students feel a lot of pressure. They lose the day-to-day -day enjoyment, and when they take time off, they feel like the goal moved farther away from them. And our approach is not like that. We we don't approach the end result as black belt because you know, as you know, black belt is just the beginning. We approach it as, okay, you want you take a month off this summer, you take a month off in December. I'm looking forward for you to come back in January. And if you re don't know this form for your next level, we're going to start that. So we identify what they're going to do when they come back so they have something to look forward to. So we keep their suspend, mental suspension on the present thing versus aiming for black belt so many months or years down the road. It's almost like no one started in high school when they walk into a high school freshman and first thing they want to do is say, I can't wait to graduate. Right. But you have to say, I can't wait to go to this class because the teachers are really nice. I can't wait to go to that class because the subject is fun. Or I can't go here because everybody loves being around me and one looking forward to me to come in. Mm. So most dojos dangling the rank is the reason why the student go to class. We dangling the community as you don't come, your classmate missing a training partner, missing your energy, your fun. So the pressure is more of the dojo needs you more than you need the belt. And that's the difference. It's fascinating, and it sounds like the philosophy in the style of giving people some flexibility, some space to individualize isn't just in the curriculum, but it's in the culture of the schools. 
And I, I wonder when, if you're willing to share, when you talk about students taking time off, how many of them come back? 95%. Okay. Which, because we tell, because we tell them, okay, you take this month off or six weeks off, you're traveling or do stuff. And your classmate will, will stay in contact, say, all right, hey, I don't want to lose a training partner. And then when they like you as an instructor, they will come back. If they like a kata, they will eventually wear out. So when you ask a student, what's your favorite subject in school? They usually name the teacher. Right? They don't say, well, I like physics because, you know, force, you know, mass and force and acceleration or whatever. They usually say, oh, Mr. Nelson is really nice guy. I like his class because he makes it fun. He explains real thorough. He makes it enjoyable to come and my classmates will help. But that's their impression. And that's the whole truth for older people. We don't want to work for micromanager. That's a bad way to manage a business. And people usually like the colleagues. They like the bosses, the environment they're in. Whatever type of work they do, they can overcome that as long as they love the people. So we want the, the student come to our dojo or our staff that love to be associated with the people that they're with first. And if they like that, they're willing to go through and learn the cards, the weapons, the techniques, the throws, the locks, or what's not. But if you teach them the techniques, for them to master the techniques of the kata, this could take weeks or months, and they will wear out. Every day they come, and they, they don't look forward to do something that because they're not good at it yet, and they don't see the end. But that, we don't focus. We focus on you come because you love hanging, spending time with your teammate, with your instructors, with your dojo mate. And then the learning part is actually secondary. Mm. So we don't ever talk about the rank. We, we never dangling the green belt, the brown belt, or you need to work hard the next 18 months to get to this belt. We, we don't talk like that at all. Mm. I, I'm, because if you dangle right. now 18 months, right, you say, tell them, if you train hard next 18 months, you get the brown belt. What happened if, when it's 18 months come, what are you going to do? And he's not ready. What are you going to do? You can't just give him a brown belt. He knows he's not ready. You know, he, then what, what can you do? You can't make a promise like that, but what you can promise him that you enjoy training and everything well will take care of itself. I'm, I'm blown away at the elegance of how simple you've presented that. I think and, and, and long-time listeners know I had a school for a very short period of time. And one of the things that we've talked a lot on this show about over the last few years is how to, how to balance rank and curriculum and keeping people motivated and all of this. And what you're saying, what makes complete sense now that I'm hearing it from you, is that the martial arts is the framework, but the important part, the part you focus on is on the culture, on making sure that people are happy and engaged. And I'm going to guess that you love teaching. Is that fair to say? You love teaching martial arts? Yes, sir. Yes, and I'm, sir. It's, uh, it, I feel like I'm, uh, you know, when I thank the student at the end of the, our international banquet at the end, I thank first and foremost at all the students I say, you guys don't realize that you live in my dream. If it wasn't for you, I would not be the man that I am. You help shape me. You make me enjoy this. I, I appreciate you here to give me a chance to grow the arts within me, to grow my personality. So they feel like they're part of the team. If your approach is you're doing someone of a favor, teaching them something to get them to black belt, that approach works with half of people. But when you make them feel the more important that all of a sudden, oh my goodness, if I quit, I'm messing him, him up. So I'm helping him and, I, and along the way, I'm helping myself. So I'm gone. 
people. They feel somewhat of a obligation to help me grow as an instructor also and help their classmates, inspire their classmates and train. So they feel like they have bigger calling. So they came to decide, you know, getting a brown belt is not important to me anymore. But then they see themselves, wait a minute, but there's some other people live effect if, if I just quit. So they have to double tech and think again. And that's important. And that's what we press. And I hope the school owners out there who have been asking for more content around how to grow their school, I hope you will rewind the last 10, 15 minutes or whatever it was and listen to that again, because I don't know that we could put anything out that would be better. Obviously, there's more than one way to grow a school and more than one way to approach a martial arts school as an owner. But I mean, this, this is a, a perfect example of how focusing on the people, the culture, the, the humanity, the human element in a school leads to growth. I mean, 50 schools from a, I guess we can call it a third generation, second to third generation martial art is, is pretty impressive. And I, I don't think it's an accident. And, and you know, I, I can kind of be a, a little bit to the side and tell you, people want to have a sense of belonging. It it it's been that way in in ancient time, and you know years ago martial art founded where people doesn't have a lot to do. They're in a small village, or the Buddhist monk or the monastery, or people they train, but they feel like they're part of something. Okay, uh, but those days that to be ultra disciplined and make you do because there's nothing to do, it's easy to get students. Today we compete against. 5,200 channels on Netflix, you know, 80 TV channels and all kind of activities, all kind of comfort level. So people still have to like who they with. They to train. It's not the art, it's the people. Uh, look, even really bad people, why do they join to the gang where they know it's bad and doing bad things? Because they want to belong to something. And when you look at a club, fraternity, sorority, or different kind of club. People want to belong in a club, so it gives them an identity of something bigger than themselves. And maybe some people feel that need to belong as like an extended family. And Kung Nhu, we call ourselves the art of love. We're the extended family that you come and, uh, and, and hang out. And every year we have this international event. We don't call that a martial art training weekend. We call it a family reunion mm. and every time we have a weekend where we get together and train and they come in they train train and the last day we have a big party we have dinner party we have people stayed over and talk and do anything but talk about martial art we don't talk about martial art when we know how to eat why because the informal organization is just as important as the formal organization and being a business person that I am, I realize that that's very important. It's not people don't go to you to do work at their house or their business because you're 5% more or less on the proposal, but they do work with you because of who you are. They like you. They will have trust and they want to be around you. And that same true for business, same true for clubs. So why wouldn't it be same true for karate? Because most people that jo student that join martial art, they don't know kind of one, kind of five, kind of ten weapons, but they join because the chemistry they have, they how they feel when they walk in. But you can't oversell this hype when you don't have a personal relationship with them. And the moment you promise them a rank, this is dangerous, extremely dangerous. Because you box yourself in the corner that when that time comes, you have to give that girl a blue bell, even though she's not ready. So now you compromise your integrity because you promise something. It's almost like, tell me if I take economic, I'm going to get a B. If I go to class three times a week. Well, maybe it may take me more than six weeks. It may take me eight weeks. But you can't make that promise because once you do, 
and they know they didn't deserve it, they know it's bogus, eventually they quit. Hmm. And that's the big difference. You can't say, you come here, you train hard, three times a week for eight weeks, you probably can get this right. You don't. You, you can't even predict that. You say, you train hard, you enjoy, the rank will come, you're going to earn it, and you're going to love it. In the meantime, you love every day training instead of only eight weeks or 12 weeks. You only, you only love that one day you get promoted, and that's why people get burned out. Instead of love, the actual coming to class. And that's our approach. Where did this approach come from? Is this from you or from your father or someone else? Uh, from my dad, because yeah. my dad loved to teach, and it, it, it kind of passed it on. He enjoyed teaching. He would showed up on a Sunday at a public park to teach two students that fall behind during the week. He would tell them, why don't you come meet me out in the park, you know, under t- trees, and we'll just kind of work out for an hour and a half on Sunday and just catch you up for all the class you miss. And because when you, when you look at your time as an instructor, it's the equal time as a student, and you do it a few times, they, they value you, and they don't want to let you down. Mm-hmm. But if you look at your time as, oh, I'm not going to teach one or two students, then they, they feel that way. It's like going to a doctor's office. You sit there, and you have to wait an hour and a half. You feel like this is bogus. But if you go into where a place where they have high service lab value, you have great service. Maybe the food is not A+, plus, but you walk out there, you forget what the food tastes like because you already swallow. But you remember the service. You never forget the service. You know, you, and, and we look at karate is like eating at a restaurant. They're not going to remember certain technique or how they been teach, but they remember the positive, friendly, wonderful, encouraging experience. And and they want they want that experience more than they want to learn a new kick. Good stuff. Obviously your father's been a huge influence on you. But is there anyone else that when you consider who you are now as a father, as a man, as a martial arts instructor, as a martial artist, is there somebody else that's been really influential for you? Uh, well, I graduated from college and I worked with a boss and, and I'm a very calculated and thinking person. And I remember he brought me in the office and told me, Quinn, don't forget, a good plan today is a ba- better than a perfect plan tomorrow. And, that, and then he looked at me and said, there might not be a perfect plan ever. You don't know. And I realized at that moment that all my hesitation to let me be me, it's gone because I'm going to do what I know at that moment and not worry about where someone thinks that I didn't show to them this is really better than this or a certain way. And basically that was a profound moment in my life that you go do your best at that moment. and. And you know better next time, but if you don't do and you sit there and you think about it, then you do nothing. And when you do nothing, you give some, nobody your time. And you, when you don't give them the time, you don't create new memories. So I become a very given man in many aspects because of that. And then through time, I realized that failure is doing something that you less than capable of instead of somebody doing something better than you. So I evolved from when he said that Ed White told me that versus failure is about me not doing something that I should be doing versus about me getting a B in in American history and somebody getting an A. It doesn't matter because my B was the best I can get and I'm good with that. So it shaped me to be a given, content person. And when you do it, your students will know that you love them. You give them what you got. And they can feel it. And they can feel you're a given person. And they're willing to get to a certain level to give it back to you. 
to to show you to be like you because you make them feel good by giving your time and energy and knowledge and they know that if they do the same for their friends or families or anything outside of martial arts even it makes them feel good and so they they try to emulate someone that you know, our goal is we want your student to love you first. They respect you second. Mm. In martial art traditionalists, it's the other way. Right. You, you know, today culture, if they love who you are, they will respect you. They will follow you. They look at you the leader. But if you want to respect you first, whether that's our knowledge, power, longevity, whatever. That's that's a short term management. You can manage that process, but you can't lead people with that. Eventually people, you know, they'll get to a certain level. They respect you, but they don't love you enough to stay with you. You follow me? This is different. I do. So I do. So all our black belt, we had meetings, we always talked about it. we Karate is a small facet of life. When you teach students, you can't come across that you're some superior human being because there's hundreds of other things that they know more than you, and they don't call themselves superior to you. You can't come across it's something like that because the intimidation the, doesn't mean the students don't bow to you, yes, and say, that's not what I'm saying here. It's the emotional aspect. So our style is actually really good at the at going for the heart first and the muscle sack. Great stuff. Great stuff. We've talked a lot about the past. We've talked about today. Let's let's look into the future. I'm assuming you're not going to hang up your hat, so to speak, anytime soon and stop teaching. So what is it that's keeping you motivated or or to say it in another way do you have goals are there things you're trying to accomplish uh yes yeah, you know the style has legs on its own it it kind of self-run we have so many masters and hot instructors and students that respect the system in in the sense that because it own the ownership is by everyone the logo we have is owned by everyone. No one owns the logo. It belongs to everybody. So that part, one day, I'm 54, but one day when, you know, when I'm just kind of take half a step back, the student will know who the leader, but the leader is really not. You lead to show them where to go because all our black belts and students, they know where to go. They're going to the same spot I am. I'm basically to hang on to the code to get there with them because their spirit and energy and drive, it's exactly like mine. I've just been around longer, but doesn't mean my spirit any better. So I don't look at it that way. Uh, so the style's in good hand, no matter how we roll forward 10, 15 years, 20 years from now, because of the cultural thinking. But uh, I have a, a kid on in college now, and I've actually started a motivational keynote speaking uh, business to start in this month. It's been six years of planning. And part of that is I want to help mentor small business or business startup or business operation for people that don't have a good background in business but need help. And also I want to mentor and be a parent parental coach and to parents that raising school age children uh, from you know young through college. And part of that is uh, the recognition of bringing it back to basics. Most parents use the term tough love. In reality, is, there's no such thing as tough love. It's called true love. You love your children, you put them first, their future first. You have to do what's right to them. Sometimes parents name tough love, but they don't want to do a certain thing to make them 
feel like bad, so they want to be a good guy, so they're not willing to demand a certain thing out of their children, so they coin the term tough love so they don't have to do it. And reality is, no, unconditional love means you have to do it for the sake of the children. You, you expect a certain behavior, certain character traits, certain training, certain respectfulness that come with that, certain work ethic. That's for them. You, if you don't, and you hand them a TV remote or buy them some games to play and leave you alone, that's, that's conditional love. Basically, you love your children when your life's easy, but reality is it's uh, that's not true love. So I want to coach that because I've been, I travel a lot. I see thousands of kids and I can see, I retrain the program, the behavior. Uh, I'll give you a simple example. Animal kingdom, you know, when you go, to, when you see the animals, they, they have a hierarchy, right? <laughs> How, why does parents walk into the restaurant and have their kids run all over and walk up and order stuff first? Your children should never, ever order food before you in any circumstance when they're children. Because they have to watch how you behave when you walk in. Let's say I have to take my kids in Burger King. They don't make a move. They look at the. They don't say a word until I order respectfully, so they can watch my behavior and how I do and how respectful it is. So you teach them by watching, and then they know the hierarchy is nothing moves until the alpha male or female moves. Basically, the wolf hunt. Until the alpha wolf opened the carcass, there's no cubs going to run up and start eating. It doesn't work that way in, in our DNA. So when the parents let the kids slit ahead of them all the time, at the end of the day, that's what they're trained to do. They're ahead of you. So when they're 14, 15, 16, they think they're ahead of you. And the genetic kicked in that they want to buck you to be the alpha of the household. But then people say teenagers are difficult. No, because you didn't know how to put them in the right mode. And um, so I want to work on the behavior and the characteristics and traits and stuff for the parent to help the society to get to what it's supposed to. Uh, we're not talking about physical and, and mental and harassment and punishment. We're not talking about we're talking about treating them like an adult, young adult at their level that makes sense. You know, you, they, you know, when my children have a birthday, I always tell them to make a Mother's Day card for their mom. Why do I call their mom and tell them why? Because they know that day their mom did work and they have to appreciate that so they don't put them ahead. And when we have a birthday cake, I let them blow out candles. All the friends come over and I cut one cake, piece of cake for me, one for their mother and set aside. And it's not like you steal their food. There's plenty. And then the birthday boy or girl get to eat after we cut our piece out. Why? Nothing moved till the alphas get their place first. Even, <laughs> I mean, it's just a very simple genetic disposition in, in animal kingdom and human. We should think that, oh, get, let your kid eat first. What's the harass? No, you, you let them do that for 10 years. They think they get it before you do. It doesn't work like that. And so those are some of the simple things that people miss. I, my son had an 18th birthday. We brought some of his friends and stuff going to a restaurant. We sat down. The waitress come up. The old birthday boy sit with a little hat. He looked at what you want. He wouldn't say a thing. He looked over at me until she looked at me, until she takes my order. He doesn't order. Mm. And it's not like I'm eating his food. He's running out of food. That's not what we're saying. <laughs> right. But they have to know. It's like in karate, martial arts. There's a hierarchy. You know, you, 
you just a green belt just doesn't run over and climb over and tell the brown belt line up behind me, right? You don't line up a green belt ahead of a brown belt. And a brown belt definitely doesn't line up in front or move the black belt around. So where is it that you let your children line up in everything ahead of you? That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so that's my new company. I want to break down to basics. And it's about communication. It's about experience. It's about wisdom. It's about bringing young people back into daily life like martial arts. There's a level of recognition. If you have your place in the sun. Uh, when it's your time, you get there. But but you're not more important than anybody else. You take your turn and you learn patience. You learn respect and you learn your self-control. And um, I'm looking forward to take it outside of martial arts world because there's more people non-martial artists than martial arts. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. Now, if people are listening and they want to, you know, learn more about you or your style, or maybe maybe they want to see if there's a a school, a Kunyu school nearby, where would they go on the internet? Yeah, kungyu.com. You know, they can go on the kungyu.com and they look and just go there. And if you call any schools, if you're close by, if you want to come visit, stay for a week to train, you're going to find out it's almost like you walk into a group of people that you know for a long time. Everyone is very open-minded, very friendly, very receptive. But we don't have an ego. We don't flex our muscle. We don't have this bow down attitude at all. I mean, at all. We invite instructors from different arts to come to many of our events to teach their specialty. And a lot of our low rank and instructors taking those classes and appreciate it. And I myself actually take some of the classes myself and just really enjoy and, and thankful that Someone showed us something that opened our horizon a little bit. Mm. So uh, it's pretty cool. I agree. I agree. And I, I think it's more than pretty cool. I think it's wonderful. And I think that you are setting the model for what I believe the future of martial arts, traditional martial arts schools will be based around that that culture, that family approach. And I hope... Some of the folks listening who have influence will take notice for what you're saying. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, Go ahead. I think, I think what it is, is a lot of people think that if you laugh and joke with your students outside class, they lose respect for you. Uh, you know, if you give up 10% of what you think, they lose respect for you and get 50% of love for you, you have that student a lot longer. Yeah, there there are a lot of people in the world that I respect, but I have no desire to spend time with them. Right, because you don't love and enjoy your time like that. Exactly. But if you do, you love and enjoy your time, then you, you're looking forward to that daily grind and love that aspect. You know, so in martial arts, it's, it's a volunteer thing. You pay and you make it inconvenient for you to go to class. So the last thing you want to do is go there and feel more mental pressure or subject to an order, you know, and because we're not training martial arts for survival anymore. It's more of an art uh, training and discovering ourselves. It's not a military thing where years ago you train, you have to take order. So you, you do or you, or you out of here. Well, it's just the, uh, the paradigm shift is change. So if you don't change with time, you know, you're still driving that 1936 Ford car or 1968 Corvette. It's not going to run the same as a 2020 Corvette today. It has the aesthetic and value on collection, but if you're talking about performance, no chance. You know? So human are like that. They have to feel wanted and love and appreciate. 
instead of feel you're lucky to be here. So even being head of the style, when I see a white belt come in, I teach them, I always thank them again, appreciate you coming here and give us a chance to make you feel like you want to be part of this friendship and family here. Never we say, I want you to get good. I want you to get your green belt. No, we never we never talk about karate like that. We're talking about people. I love it. You've shared so much today, and I really appreciate your time. And I, I thank you for, for everything that you've done. But I'd love to ask for, for one small favor as we start to, to wrap up here. What parting words, what advice would you <laughs> offer to the folks listening today? Um, very easy. We all, we all have who we are. We, you have to be true to yourself. But, you know, when I say perspective, perspective, they say is true. No, some of us put out this perspective of who we are. We're not true to ourselves. So from a finance standpoint, if, if I make $10 an hour, and I can live with eight dollars an hour. I should. I am wealthy because I can live within my means. So don't paint this perspective in martial art. With whatever rank you are, if you put your ego where you want to think you're better than you are. In reality, if you're better than you, you should be happy. So my parting words for everybody. Keep your perspective and your self-esteem, self-worth first. Don't have to prove to anybody anything, but prove to yourself. Um, and to finish up, when I was in college, they made me memorize this poem, and the last three lines was this. And I live by that. Say, you may go down the pathway of life and get a pat on your back as you pass. But the final result will be headache and tears if you cheated the man in the glass, which is the mirror. So if you cheated you, that's enough. So you can lie and cheat and, and make this perception to people, whether it's your life, your relationship, your martial arts skills, it's irrelevant. You learn to cheat you, it becomes a habit, a habit turn into your character and your character will be your destiny. And so be true to yourself, be humble, love people because they're the one who make you better and uh, good luck to everybody. As we talked about today, I had a martial arts school of my own for a little while. We've talked about that on the show before, but I have to say, this is the first time in 392 episodes that a guest made me want to open a school again. I love teaching and I love the opportunities that I have traveling around, working with people. But the way Grandmaster No talks about martial arts and teaching and family, I've been part of some of those schools. And I hope those of you that have not been that fortunate will at least check out what they've got going on online with Kung Yu because it's pretty amazing stuff. Thank you, sir, for your time today. I really enjoyed our conversation, and I hope our paths cross sometime in the future. You can find the photos and the links and everything that we've got going on from today's conversation at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And of course, whistlekick.com and the code PODCAST15 will get you 15% off everything that we make. If making a purchase isn't in your future, maybe you'll consider sharing an episode, maybe this one. Maybe you'll go somewhere like the Apple Podcast, iTunes Store, whatever they call it these days, and leave us a review. Maybe you'll make a comment on our social media. We're at Whistlekick on YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, Instagram, and probably some others. We're all over the place. And if you want some private conversation, if you want to reach out and leave, leave a comment that you don't want anybody else to see, you can do that. Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. I read all of my own email. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.